In this video, we will have a look at designing Azure virtual networks. First, we will have a look at a few scenarios where you would need new VNets created. VNet stands for virtual networks. And then we will have a look at a few examples of different VNet topologies. It's simple enough to create a virtual network. You can create them from here in the Azure portal, or you can use PowerShell or the CLI, and you give it the usual stuff. You can give it a subscription from here. You want the VNet to belong to. You can specify the region you want to deploy it in from here. Assign it to a resource group to group your resources together. If we go to IP addresses, you give it an IP address space from here. And later you can create the subnets from the address spaces as well. Going back to basics, we give it a VNet name and go into security. There's some additional security services here as well for the VNet and so on. But the real understanding to virtual networks are to understand the reasons why you're creating them. Well, you need one to create the very first one and to put your resources in. But why would you need other virtual networks? So in this video, I wanted to go over a scenario just to share some ideas really on creating Azure virtual networks. So the first thing, just to cover off what an Azure virtual network is. A virtual network is a network, but it's in the Azure cloud and why it's called a virtual network. It could resemble the same sort of network we have in the data center where you have all your data center resources in there and are segmented off in their own subnets and segmented off by firewalls, load balancers, routers, etc. We can do all of that with the virtual networks as well in the Azure cloud. You can get the virtual network connected to other virtual networks and you can connect it to the internet as well and connect back to your on-premise offices and data centers. Connecting virtual networks together is also known as VNet peering. There's also a VNet to VNet connection, which is like an IPsec connection. It's an encrypted connection. It's more secure, but the most common way is just to use standard VNet peering. So we'll have a look at that. The message I wanted to get across on this slide here is that VNet peering, which is connecting virtual networks to each other. You've got quite a bit of flexibility on how you can do that within Azure. So if we have a look at this example here, we can connect virtual networks or peer virtual networks across different regions. So in this example, it's UK South and UK East. So our VNets can be in different regions and VNet peering will work absolutely fine. But we can also do it across different Azure Active Directory Azure tenants. So here between tenant X and tenant Y, this would work as well. So VNet peering across different Active Directory tenants would work fine as well. And you can do VNet peering even if they are in completely different subscriptions. So in this example, we've got subscription X here and we've got subscription Y here. We've got a VNet in this one and we've got a VNet in this one as well. We can do VNet peering between them absolutely fine as well. So it doesn't matter if the VNets are in different regions or in different active directory tenants or in different subscriptions, we can do VNet peering without any issues. When designing virtual networks, it's important to have a good understanding of Azure subscriptions, regions and network resources. So with network resources, anything you create in Azure is a resource. For example, a virtual machine is a resource. The network adapter interface used by a VM is a resource. Even the public IP address is a resource. The public IP address used by the network interface card. And the VNet the NIC is connected to is a resource too. And with regions and subscriptions, a region is basically a set of data centers and a subscription is linked to an account and is like a container used for billing purposes. And resources are created within an Azure region and subscription. And a resource has to be connected to a VNet that exists in the same region and subscription. So if we have a look at the diagram in front as an example, we can see these resources here. We can deploy these into this VNet here because it's in the same region, region UK South, and the same subscription, subscription X. But these same resources we cannot deploy into this VNet here, East US VNet simply because it's a different region. So this region is region East US. So this cannot be done. And also these resources cannot be deployed into this region here. That should say Japan for this VNet. But because it's a different region, Japan East, and also because the subscription is different as well, subscription Y. So just bear those rules in mind when creating VNets. 
And before we start having a look at design patterns of virtual networks, Avena itself is characterized by a collection of address spaces defined as CIDR blocks. And a subnet is a child resource of a VNet and helps define segments of address spaces. A network interface card can be added to subnets and connected to VMs. So let's have a look at scenario next on creating VNets. We have this Azure environment in front. It's a new subscription, it's an Azure environment. And the first thing we need to do is create a virtual network. And by the way, this is just an example. VNets are also created when creating a resource. For example, when you create your first virtual machine or a container, within the networking tab of those resources, you can also create a VNet right from there instead. So you don't need to create a VNet as a standalone VNet. You can create them as part of a resource. And we've decided that our new public facing services is going to be deployed into Azure. So we throw some public facing web servers in there. We put them in and of course we need to put them in our network in Azure. This is called our VNet or the full name is virtual network. And we need to abide by the usual rules for VNets and resources such as such as the resources. We need to be part of the same region and subscription of the VNet and so on. We just described in the previous slide. So we've deployed these three servers here in a server farm. So server one, server two, server three, these are our web servers. I'll speak about the NSGs in a second here. And as we also need a backend database farm for our public facing web servers, we throw some of those in as well. So we've got some backend databases here as well. So as it currently stands, there's no firewalls in place. All traffic can currently reach each other. All the web servers can communicate with all the database servers and all the databases can communicate with the web servers. We need to control the traffic flow between the two different services. And for this, we can implement an Azure firewall or equally a third party firewall. General term for them is a network virtual appliance or can even enforce access control via something called network security groups which are a bunch of firewall rules, but we can attach these rules to the individual servers or to the subnets as a whole. And the whole point of doing this again is, although the VNet may be isolated from anything else, the resources within the VNet can reach each other on any port. So this is where you would want to configure these network security groups or a virtual firewall. So it's enforcement of access control within the VNet between the subnets or between the virtual machines within the subnet. And these rules can contain multiple inbound and outbound security rules that enable you to filter traffic to and from resources by source and destination IP addresses, ports and protocols. So in this example, a firewall appliance might be an overkill. It might be just too expensive to run. So we will go with network security groups. But applying rules to each survey is going to be a massive management overhead because network security groups, you can apply it to the subnet, attach it to the subnet or apply it to the NICs or even apply it to the VMs as well. Actually, there's a third option, but best practice dictates you should generally speaking, apply it to the subnet or should I say Microsoft Azure recommends this option? I mean, it depends how sensitive your services are. So uh, best practice would be to attach it to the subnet, generally speaking. And this is to keep management overhead to a minimum. So we use NSGs at a subnet level. Within the subnets, all servers can speak to each other. Between the subnets is controlled by the network security groups. So it's less management overhead to manage these network security groups when attaching them to subnets rather than having an NSG for each of the NICs on each virtual machine, which will be a massive burden to keep them updated every time a change is needed to be made. So in this situation, everything within this subnet, if it's talking to this subnet, it's um, controlled by the NSG and same on this side as well via the NSG. But if you needed a lot more granular control, you needed server farm one to be speaking only on certain ports and IP addresses or whatever to server farm three, then you would need to attach the NSGs to the particular server farms themselves, the servers themselves. But you can additionally deploy a virtual appliance, a virtual firewall. And that will give you all the additional lovely features that firewalls give you, such as all the security protection and all the logging and analytics and everything else that firewalls give you nowadays. Now we need an internet connection as well. And since it's a server farm, we add a load balancer with a public facing IP address and we can even add a web application firewall to protect the servers from attacks. 
So connections from the internet will be protected by this web application firewall here and the load balancer will distribute the traffic across the three server farms and of course you will need another load balancer as well to distribute traffic to these databases here as well. So again, going back to the scenario, this is our first Azure environment, brand new environment, and this is the first time we've hosted some public facing web services to the internet and we enjoy the benefits of the cloud. So we've decided the cloud is where we want to go with the rest of our infrastructure services. So we want to start shifting our data center services to the cloud. Since our public facing web server VNet is an isolated VNet, it was never created with a mindset that we will be moving the whole data center to the cloud. The subnet allocation is also quite small. So rather than changing anything on the current VNet, we want to leave all that alone and create a brand new VNet for production and design it accordingly with the subnets, the workloads, the security around them and everything else. So here's our brand new production VNet here. And the first thing we're going to do with this VNet is because we need connectivity between the cloud and the data center, which is also known as a hybrid deployment where a company is utilizing services in both the cloud and in the DC. And it's very common to do this. A lot of companies are doing it. So for this, we'll use an express route connection, which is a private connection. It doesn't use the internet. It goes over the ISP backbone network and provides better reliability and performance. So we set up this express route connection back to our data center. And this is known as a hybrid deployment. We now have a production VNet and we also have connectivity back to the data center as well. But we also want to connect our on-premise offices to the VNet as well. And we decide to go for the cheaper option to add connectivity to the on-premise offices. And we include VPN connectivity on the on-premise offices so users can get to the cloud services. So we include a VPN connection to the on-premise offices so users can get to the cloud services from their office locations as well. Now, if you've noticed in the title of this VNet, I've called it Production Hub VNet, with hub being the keyword. And the reason for this is when setting up hybrid deployments, when using the cloud and the data center, and if you're going to have lots of VNets and workloads, it's good practice to set up a hub and spoke topology VNet, where you put all your DMZ perimeter connectivity type services in there, and then you have all your spoke VNets for your workloads that peer with the hub. Now this way, all the spoke VNets utilize all of the services in the hub VNet rather than creating each service in every spoke. And the reason you do this is because this way all spoke VNets, so all the spoke VNets, utilize all the services in the hub VNet and then you are using the hub VNet as the shared service. So the shared services that all the spokes need are in the hub. So for example here, I will add some spoke VNets here very shortly, but with these spoke VNets, they can all utilize everything within the hub VNet here. They'll be shared services. So you don't need to create express route connection or VPN connections for each of the spokes. You just create them once in the hub and all the spokes utilize everything within the hub, including all security services as well. So these are the security services. So all firewall connectivity, web application firewalls, load balancers, DDoS protection, and of course the connectivity back to the data center and the offices all the sports can utilize these services within the hub when traversing through the Azure cloud into the data center and offices and back as well and to the internet itself as well. But also we can put things like DNS in here as well since all the spokes would utilize a single DNS service and some of the Active Directory components as well and even PKI, so PKI infrastructure is another one we can put into the hub VNet. So anything that is shared, anything that all the spokes would utilize and make use of we would put in the hub. And here are the spokes. So let's just say we need isolated spoke VNets for deploying the same repeatable workloads. For example, deploying the same workloads for production, dev test, user acceptance testing, staging pre-production and so on. So we've got VNets for each of these here, production, dev test, UAT and staging. We've got VNet peering between all of these and the hubs. So all of these spokes can utilize all of these services within the hub. And that's why it makes sense to put DNS and Active Directory components uh, like ADDS and the PKI and things like that into the hub. Then we don't need to create all of these services in the spokes as repeatable services. We just create them once in the hub. 
And the Hubbard Spoke topology can also resolve any subscription limits for when there are very large cloud-based workloads that hit the limit of a single subscription. So peering VNets from different subscriptions is another use case why you would use this. Uh, there are other benefits as well to it. And just to fill up the empty area on the right hand side, let's put a few more VNets in there as well. These VNets are isolated VNets, as in they don't even have access to the hub. So nothing to do with this hub and spoke environment. They are just isolated VNets. Let's just say they are needed by a couple of departments within the company who have a bunch of services and want to administer their own VNets, creating their own services, carving their own subnets in the VNets and everything else. So from a management perspective, we can give them dedicated VNets and give them full management rights to their VNets. So it's just another use case of why you may isolate VNets and create dedicated VNets for different departments that want their own VNets and they want them to be isolated, they want their own services in them and they want full administrative management rights to their own VNets. And the last bit of the puzzle is we have just acquired a new company who already have an Azure subscription with their own set of services and we wanted to provide connectivity between them and us. So we create a couple of connections between us and them. And to do this, we use VPN gateways instead of using standard VNet peering due to compliance requirements to secure the traffic. And this is also called VNet to VNet connections, which is like an IPsec tunnel. So this is our newly acquired company on the left hand side here. And we have provided it connectivity using VPN gateway devices. So a connection from here to here and a connection from here to here as well. We didn't need this VPN gateway device actually because we already have one here. So that was just a mistake, but yeah, that's how we will connect it together. So now both Azure subscriptions and VNets all have connectivity to each other. Even though it's over the Microsoft Azure backbone network, the company compliance requirement says that the traffic needs to be encrypted. And so this is why we went with a VPN gateway instead. Now, just to finish off on having a look at some different topology examples. The first one we will have a look at is multi-layer hub and spoke VNet topology. Now, with a multi-layer hub and spoke VNet topology, spokes can become hubs themselves of other spokes, creating a two-level hierarchy and so on. So, for example, let me just get the uh, pen. This production spoke here, we can have it as a, a hub, a second layer hub. Right, and then what we would do is create some spokes off it as well here, and uh, these will be spokes to this hub. You can have its own internet as well down here, and it can become a, a WAN, a virtual WAN. And we can put all the same sort of security services and infrastructure services like we did in this hub down here as well. So we can do that, that's one example. And the next one is the flat. VNet topology, which is a nice, simple and easy one. And with this one, it's just a single VNet with subnets and NSGs providing segregation and traffic control. So we've got here workload one, workload two, workload three, workload four. These are all individual subnets and the NSGs are providing access control between them. And the last one is a meshed VNet topology. And this is where VNets are all directly connected to each other. The virtual networks can be connected together using a peering connection and once peered they can send traffic to each other over the Azure Backbone Network. So you can see here we've got all the different VNet peering connections here. And VNets just don't stop there, there's all sorts of other things you've got to consider as well such as things like disaster recovery, business continuity, backups, maybe replication of services within the VNets and all of these kind of things as well.